It was in 1963 that I first developed an interest in Wagner, or Wagner, as my speech synthesizer pronounces him. Wagner, more than any other person before or since, had the ability to compose music that has an emotional effect. It reaches a level no one else does. He was a, must have been an awful, difficult man. Betrayed everything and everybody for his going forward. I'm a survivor of Auschwitz. I cannot be rational with a person who was the first to preach a separation of races, the first, in fact, who created the notion of a uh, nation of masters which should rule the world. We still have survivors from the uh, death camps, like myself. I'm a survivor of Auschwitz and other camps. Why should in Israel should we pe perform Wagner? Part of Wagner's fascination is that there are so many people who still feel so incredibly negative and disgusted by him as a musician and as a, as a person, as a personage. And that keeps it alive. Wagner for me is indispensable. It's an antidote to all this turbulence here in New York. Uh, it's sublime music. It's like uh, therapy for me. When my nerves are on end, that's when Wagner comes in to the rescue. Richard Wagner was born in Leipzig on the 22nd of May, 1813, the ninth child of Johanna and Karl Friedrich Wagner, a police official. In those days, Leipzig was a city occupied by French troops at the end of the Napoleonic Wars. Richard spent his formative years in Leipzig, but a mystery surrounds the details of his birth. His father died soon after his baptism, and his mother immediately arranged for the family to live with an actor and painter, Ludwig Geyer. Now, the question is whether she was already having an affair with Gaia during the period when Wagner was born, whether he was actually conceived by Gaia or not. Gaia is a Jewish name, which doesn't mean that everybody who is called Gaia is Jewish. The question is whether Wagner thought he was Jewish. And he was himself called Gaia until the age of 15, Richard Gaia. He had to sign himself Richard Gaia in school which meant a kind of identity change when he changed the name to Wagner. His first musical experience was learning to play a chorus on the piano from Weber's Der Freischutz. And the important thing about that for him was that Gaia taught him how to play it. He learned to compose by getting a book about how to harmonize bass lines. The truth is, though, I think he was taught more than he lets on, because the image he wants to give in his autobiography is of, is of the great genius, like Siegfried, sort of a musical Siegfried. He can do music without necessarily being taught. There was a man called Müller, who he went to and found he couldn't pay. There was a man called Weinlich, it looks as though Weinlich in particular, gave him really a pretty good basic grounding in fairly up-to-date techniques of writing symphonies. tremendous influence on Wagner and Wagner always liked to claim that Beethoven was growing out of the symphony uh, by writing the ninth the you know, voices came in and and so of course heading towards the great uh, music dramas of, of Wagner um, it may be that he really felt that or it may be that he liked to to fit Beethoven into his own portrait after a brief spell at Leipzig University, Wagner worked as a chorus master in provincial opera houses and composed his first two operas, Forbidden Love, in the style of light Italian opera, and The Fairies, influenced by Karl Maria von Weber, the most popular German composer of the day.
When Wagner was 21, he fell in love with the actress Minna Plana, who soon became his wife. I think in the case of Wagner and Minna, it seems to have been an attraction of opposites. I mean, Wagner was highly emotional and highly articulate and certainly highly ambitious and intellectually curious, and Minna was, well, <laughs> none of those things. But she was physically attractive and also domesticated and socially accomplished. It was when he changed and grew and developed that she didn't know how to cope with him and very much resented the fact that he wouldn't use his evident talent just to earn enough money to pay the bills. He was always in debt and always borrowing money and not paying people back and she found it all a nightmare. And she had a, a sort of um, what would nowadays be called a suburban soul and he couldn't stand it eventually. It was at the German Opera House in Riga, the capital of Latvia, where Wagner secured his first important post as conductor. This is all that's left of the theatre in Riga where Wagner conducted. This is the ballroom, and it's still extant. Beneath was the theatre, no longer in existence, but there are plans that still exist for it. Wagner remembered three things about the theatre. First, that it was dark. Second, that the stalls were raked upwards like an amphitheatre. And third, that the orchestra pit was a sunken pit. These three ideas he kept in mind for his ideal theatre later in Bayreuth. Riga was hugely important for Wagner, both as composer and as a conductor. As a conductor, he rehearsed nearly 40 operas. And he performed some of his own compositions in the main concert hall here, in the Schwarzhoit Bazaar. As a composer, he composed the first two acts of Rienzi and uh, a, a, an interesting little song called Der Tannenbaum, which he later said was one of the first compositions where his own voice comes to the fore. He said he composed it in a Livonian Latvian key. It sort of sounds like this with lots of flowing E minor sounds. And it, it reminds one very much of his later masterpiece, The Ring. It sounds like this which are typically Wagnerian. You can already hear in this early song. It's the first composition of Wagner's that's really his. While he was composing Rienzi, Wagner started to make sketches for the Flying Dutchman in Riga. Always living beyond his means, his debts mounted, and to avoid imprisonment, he fled from his creditors, a pattern that would recur throughout his life. He managed to escape to the Baltic coast and got on a ship on a very stormy trip to Paris. This is where Wagner's career really begins, and the Flying Dutchman, his first major work. Wagner arrived in Paris in 1839 when he was 26 and lived there for the next three years. Paris was not only Europe's most glamorous city, it was also the center of the opera world. Wagner's ambition was to become its brightest star. It's common knowledge that Wagner was very, very poor in Paris when he stayed for the first time. And potatoes, were, of course, is kind of menu for every day because he had absolutely no possibility to eat meat. He was unable to earn money. He was unable to have his music with success providing money for him. So he spent time begging money from his friends in Germany or in France. The most successful musician in Paris was the Jewish composer Giacomo Meyerbeer, who offered Wagner help and encouragement. But despite this, Wagner failed to secure a single performance of his operas. He perceived that the musical life of Paris was dominated by a Jewish clique, and, feeling himself an outsider, used this as a convenient excuse for his own failure. 
In order to make ends meet, he was forced to write piano arrangements of operas by another Jewish composer, Jacques Halevi. This was slave work for, for the, from the point of view of a composer who thought him, of himself as the great composer in the world. He was invited to breakfast with Halevi uh, to talk about his work for the transcription. And he was there with several journalists. And at a certain point in the conversation, everybody was speaking French. Halevi, of course, is a native French speaker. Poor Wagner doesn't speak French very well. So at a certain point, Alevi turns to him in German and says something. And the French journalists who s see this are quite surprised. And they say, what? We didn't know that Ale Monsieur Alevi could speak German. And he turns to them and says, oh, didn't you know all Jews can speak German? So Wagner, in this moment, is suddenly, in the company of Alevi, a Jew. And I think if one looks at uh, Wagner's subsequent turn to the anti-Semitic uh, writings that we know, one can recognize the fear of contamination, the fear that he has been too close to what he describes as being Jewish or French or decadent or modern, um, and therefore uh, the effort always to distance himself from that. Rienzi is an attempt, to, as Wagner himself admitted, to outdo Meyerbeer and Alevi, who were the two leading lights on the French operatic stage at the time. And in terms of its length and bombast, it certainly achieves that aim. But it is quite remarkable that he was able to write Der Fliegende Holländer in almost the same breath as um, the final sketches for Rienzi, because the two do seem to be worlds apart. Flying Dutchman is suddenly a masterpiece, a small masterpiece, but a masterpiece. And he found what he could do, and he found the themes that were going to stay with him through all the others. Um, love, death, redemption, and that's what his operas are all about. All the Flying Dutchman is the story of a sailor doomed to travel the seas forever until he's redeemed by the love of a faithful woman. In Paris, Wagner had become interested in the then fashionable topics of mesmerism and the subconscious. He used these ideas in The Flying Dutchman and all his subsequent music. In that period, there was a famous book published in Germany by someone called Enemo. It's all about magnetism that describes dreaming and sleepwalking and says that the consciousness is more awake when sleeping than it is when someone is awake. In The Flying Dutchman, when Zenta listens to a dream recounted by her, her fiancé, Eric, and Wagner writes in the stage direction, Center sinks into a magnetic sleep and dreams the dream that Eric is telling her about. It's a very sophisticated psychological observation about Center. In 1842, on Meyerbeer's recommendation, Rienzi received its premiere at the Dresden Opera House. It proved to be the biggest success of Wagner's life. Nowadays, Rienzi is not regarded as one of Wagner's finest operas. It nevertheless made him famous throughout Europe and won him the prestigious post of Royal Kapellmeister to the King of Saxony in Dresden at the age of only 29. At Dresden, he was able to spend money on establishing himself as a composer who was also an intellectual. And he began the fascinated and sometimes intensive reading of philosophers, particularly Hegel. As far as Hegel was concerned, music had come to an end with Beethoven. 
this gave Wagner a natural stimulus to develop a new style of music which would both oppose and also surpass anything that had gone before. In Tannhäuser and Lohengrin, Wagner's mission was now to change the concept of German opera, basing his stories on Teutonic myth and legend. He also pushed the limits of his sound world to new extremes, both on the stage and in the orchestra. The orchestra before Wagner was used with great brilliance and mastery by all kinds of different composers to do lots of different things. But Wagner inherits all that and fills out the gaps. He blocks and ranks his orchestra in choirs so the range of colour is much greater, but also the range of sonority and blend. Lohengrin is based on an ancient German text and is the tale of a knight of the Holy Grail who appears miraculously to save a condemned woman and marries her on condition she doesn't ask his name. But she succumbs to curiosity on her wedding night and Lohengrin is forced to return to his spiritual world. An amazing sound world. He does it, of course, in Lohengrin, um, by using almost entirely violins. He has violins divided into three different sections, all, all internally divided, some of them playing normally and others playing on harmonics. It, it, it's an amazing idea, and after a while all the violins take off together and you don't hear any cello basses or any lower instruments at all for that opening. Striking idea. I think with this work, for the first time, he felt that he'd reached the kind of stretching of music. There is something very seductive about this, and the entire opera has been conceived in a very cohesive way to exploit this power of music to draw you in and to give you the feeling that it's giving you something that you lack in your real life. In fernem land, unabar euren Schritten, liegt eine Burg, die Monsalvat genannt. Ein lichter Dämpel steht dort in Mitten, so kostbar, als auf Erden nichts bekannt. He was turned on by Greek tragedy, and he saw that the subject for their dramas, which had music, was always myth. Why, Wagner argued. The reason why myth is because myth is not limited by history. Myth enshrines timeless truths. Love and hate and all those subjects that is the stuff of drama were for Wagner most powerfully represented in, in myth. Wagner believed that by incorporating universal themes in his work, he could actually change the world in which he lived. But he was convinced there needed to be a revolution for this to happen. The Dresden Revolution of 1848 was an attempt to unify Germany into one nation from a mere confederation of small states. As an ardent nationalist, Wagner was an enthusiastic participant in the uprising, but he also believed that this was the revolution which would bring him closer to achieving his radical artistic goals. What the Saxon government did is simply to send the troops in. So uh, this made the revolutionaries even more angry at this point that the Russian anarchist Bakunin, a wild man of 19th century European politics, began to organize a violent uh, barricades. Uh, he had Wagner going up uh, church steeples to keep a lookout for the uh, Russian army on the horizon. All to no avail, of course, the Prussians came in, there were mass arrests, uh, quite a severe repression, and the whole thing was closed down. Wagner had to flee, and the old order was restored. To avoid imprisonment and possible execution, 
Wagner, now 35, fled to Zurich with the help of the composer Franz Liszt. Fired with political fervor, he stopped composing for four years to write a huge volume of theoretical essays which laid out his criteria for a new idealistic artwork of the future. This he named the Gesamtkunstwerk, or total art form, which included music, poetry, dance, and visual spectacle. Wagner believed that this new performance concept, which he called music drama, would raise art above the level of mere entertainment, the level to which he believed it had sunk in a bourgeois capitalist society. He continued to explore these themes in his most controversial booklet, Judaism in Music, in which he held the Jews responsible for everything in German art that was derivative and mediocre. This work hangs as a great shadow over Wagner's life and reputation, especially as his music later became a symbol for Nazism when Hitler and the Nazi regime used Wagner's theories to support their own racist ideology. Firstly, the anti-Semitism is crucial to his life, his whole vision of life, his personal life, his relationships. Secondly, it's absolutely central to his revolutionary theory about the redemption of the human race, especially led by the Germans, obviously. Um, thirdly, it's connected up with his socialistic and other critiques of society, bourgeois capitalism, and of morals, bourgeois morals. He doesn't like, for example, to take a trivial case, the Ten Commandments, they're Jewish because they forbid adultery, and that's inconvenient for him. So, you know, he, he actually says this, you know, do away with the Ten Commandments, a Jewish plot. Um, so so it, it's not just something that's a sort of little side dish. It's absolutely central to him, to his whole being. To, as he says, it's as vital to my being as gall is to the blood. He says that to Liszt. He really, I think, became seriously anti-Semitic after the failure of his efforts in the 1848-9 revolution. Wagner thought, in his usual rather self-centered way, that uh, a revolution in Germany would free him up to reform and, and revolutionize German music and German culture. And when this proved not to be the case, he had a very serious rethink in 1848. And it's that that led him then to write his notorious tract on Judaism in music uh, uh, just a few months later. Uh, and his real concern was to uh, try and regenerate the spirit of what he regarded as German music and he used the music of Meyerbeer particular, uh, particularly to some extent also Mendelssohn as uh, a kind of symbol of everything he hated. In Zurich Wagner began what is arguably his greatest musical masterpiece The Ring of the Nibelung, a colossal 15 hours in length consisting of four operas The Rheingold, The Valkyrie, Siegfried and Twilight of the Gods, it took Wagner an astounding 26 years to compose. He has the idea of combining A, an opera libretto that's as complex psychologically and dramatically as Shakespeare, with a musical score that's as complex um, in terms of structure and form as Beethoven. So Shakespeare plus Beethoven equals Wagner. He has to rethink his musical style. He has to make it more symphonic. He has to rethink his way of writing libretti. He has to make them more mythical, more psychological, more um, universal, if you like. This is where he sees Shakespeare. So by the time he begins The Ring, he's worked out a system where this equation of Shakespeare plus Beethoven equals Wagner is at last going to succeed. The Ring of the Nibelung is a saga based on three main characters, Wotan, king of the gods, Brunhilde, his daughter, and Siegfried, her lover. The story revolves around the possession of a ring of gold, which promises world dominance to anyone willing to renounce love, it is a tale of heroism, greed, betrayal, as well as love and redemption. It's a very violent piece. It's about human failure, murder, incest, what you want. Everything which is horrible is in there. What defies, for ordinary people, understanding is the truth that one man could carry in him 
the totality of that design could somehow construe from the first note to the last a coherent immensity of a complexity which defies analysis. itself is sometimes highly dramatic because of the fact that it is declaimed. People who sing beautifully, like they would sing uh, certain Italian arias, miss totally the expression in Wagner's music. And people who cannot sing beautifully and who only bark their way, the sort of famous Wagnerian bark, with the excuse of making the text understandable, is also only part of the truth. I'm sure that part of the, the allure and the, the captivation of Wagner is that his music never really addressed practicalities. And in many ways, it is totally impossible to perform and stage, which means that it, it remains an enigma. Only very recently, I think, have we begun to find Brunhildes who are credible on stage as well as able to fulfill the vocal demands. you have to look at a line and say, now how do I make music out of that? Wagner composes it, it's all there, whether it's from the dynamics, whether it's the shaping with the words. All you have to do is sing what's written. From the technical standpoint, they're marathon roles. You know why you're tired the next day. It's not your voice that's tired, it's your body that's tired, it's your feet, it's your knees, it's, you know, it's your back, it's, it's uh, maybe, maybe the, the muscles that you need you know, to, to make your support system work properly. It's physically exhausting. That's what a lot of people don't realize. In The Ring, Wagner used a unique musical device called the leitmotif. It was to become the single most important structural and stylistic element in all his subsequent music. Well, the leitmotif begins in simply showing something, someone, somewhere, by means of musical sound. Well, for instance, the Rheingold itself, the, the sort of title theme of the whole ring, the, the first time you hear that, it's brilliantly placed as a very memorable, sonorous image. You just hear the girls sing Rheingold to those two chords. <laughs> It's beautifully orchestrated. You can, once you've heard that, you can't forget it. And so whenever that recurs throughout the next 14 or 15 hours, it will have that connotation. The whole adventure of the gold is carried by those two chords, which in turn decay and become blackened and smirched. And the sound of Rheingold in Götterdämmerung is one of the blackest sounds ever made. <laughs> The pressures of exile had a devastating effect on Wagner's marriage, and Minna became increasingly unsympathetic to her husband's ambitions. Wagner soon began to have a number of liaisons with other women. The most famous of Wagner's extramarital affairs was that with Matilda Weisendonck, and it took place here. Otto Weisendonck was a wealthy German merchant. In 1851, he retired to Zurich. His wife, Matilda, was only 23 at the time. They soon made the acquaintance of Wagner and were happy to assist the struggling artist. The Weisendonks were nouveau riche, and to them, patronage of the arts was an important form of social acceptance. So you could say that Wagner was as important to the Weisendonks as they were to him. They provided him with the means to compose. He provided them with the opportunity to brush with genius. They were kind of living in a house at the bottom of the Weisendonks garden in Zurich, being propped up by the charity of Otto Wesendog. And he fell in love with Matilda Wesendog in a very, very idealistic and intense kind of way. And Paul Minna was, you know, the nagging wife at the bottom of the garden. Not at all, surprisingly. One can't help feeling sorry for her. 
When Wagner met Mathilde Wesendonck, he interrupted work on The Ring while writing Siegfried to begin a new work, Tristan and Isolde, an opera about two lovers whose passion for each other is so intense it can only be consummated in death. Matilda was, I think, about 15 years younger than Wagner and sophisticated and cultured in a way that the increasingly frumpish Minna wasn't. And the two of them were certainly attracted to each other, but whether the relationship was ever consummated, we shall never know. And I don't think it matters, really. I mean, it's partly that there's something slightly distasteful about sniffing the sheets in that way, but also I, I can't convince myself that it throws any light on Tristan by pointing out parallels between Wagner and Mathilde and Otto on the one hand and Tristan Isolde on the other. Tristan and Isolde is inextricably connected with the writings of Arthur Schopenhauer, with whose theories Wagner became obsessed. Schopenhauer argued that human behavior is governed not by the intellect, but by the irrational impulses of the human will, which includes ambition, love, hate, and, importantly for Tristan and Isolde, sexual desire. One possible release from this torment of life is death. Wagner, clearly at that point, when he, when he, when he took on Tristan and Isolde, he wanted to write something that was really, really different. So he, he thought of all the things he could do to make it more different and more striking. The opening phrase of Tristan and Isolde ends on a chord which leaves us all up in the air waiting for a resolution which doesn't come. Wagner gives a kind of prominence to a feeling of non-resolution which was unique in the history of harmonic language up till that time and in that way alone. It stands out in his work as one of the two or three major musical events of the whole of the 19th century. Wagner fled to Venice in 1858 at the age of 45 when Minna discovered his affair with Matilda Wesendonck and it was there, in his favorite city, that he completed the second act of Tristan and Isolde. Other than a brief reconciliation with Minna, he would never see her again. It's a paradox with Tristan. In some circles, it became scandalous because it's about sex, obviously. The music is recreating the sexual orgasm. It's saying at the same time, we have to be redeemed from the sexual impulse. The whole point of life is that through death, you're, you're actually purged of this terrible sort of sexual longing that you have in life that is a curse on your life. When he'd finished Tristan and Isolde, Wagner was at a low ebb, both financially and emotionally. His relationship with Matilda Wesendonck had come to an end, and although her husband continued to support him financially, Wagner was without the means to realize his musical ambitions. Fortuitously, the Emperor of France, Napoleon III, commissioned a new production of Tannhäuser in Paris in an attempt to build warmer relations with Austria and its ambassador, whose wife was a keen supporter of Wagner. Wagner sees the opportunity um, of doing something really quite spectacular in Paris and begins to revise Tannhäuser in the spirit of Tristan and Isolde. <laughs> so he rewrites the Bacchanal, which is, which is Tristan music plus. It's actually the most extreme piece, in my view. The Paris Bacchanal music is the most extreme music he ever wrote. <laughs> Tannhäuser is the story of a knight whose faithful lover buys his redemption with her death after he succumbs to the orgiastic pleasures of the Venusberg, a mythical world where love reigns free.
the reception of Tannhäuser was a fiasco. Not on the whole because of its musical qualities, for better or worse, but simply because of the political feelings, the anti-Austrian political feelings of a well-organized part of its audiences. Wagner was being made the scapegoat for the conservative swing in the Emperor Napoleon's political alliances. Wagner's reaction to this seems to be curiously muted. Um, and I think that's because he had come to loathe Paris, and it's always nice to have one's prejudices confirmed. And it, I think that the failure of Tannhäuser simply confirmed in him the belief that the French were frivolous and philistine and, above all, foreign, and that they were never going to be able to appreciate German art. Wagner's second attempt to take Paris by storm left him desolate, suicidal, and desperate for success. He used every opportunity to plead for help in order to realize his visionary ambitions and complete the ring. There really wasn't much of a market for 15-hour epic dramas without tunes and dancing girls. So most of Wagner's scrounging letters were, in fact, attempts to raise money to create this challenging new artwork, an artwork that was going to change the course of operatic history. Wagner's greatest patron, and the man who was directly responsible for him being able to complete the ring, was Ludwig II of Bavaria. Ludwig knew all about German Lechen from his earliest childhood. So he lived in that dream world of those myths long before Wagner came into his life. Hohen Schwangau was built in the 12th century by the Knights of Schwangau, and Ludwig grew up here with all these legends on the walls, like here, Lohengrin, the story about the Swan Knight, and this was part of his life. So Ludwig did not live only in his dreams, he lived his dreams. This has to be the ultimate 19th century dream theater. Ludwig's Venus Grotto at Schloss Linderhof, a private grotto where he could experience for himself all the delights of the Venusberg. This is her grotto. And the painting that you see behind there shows Venus surrounded by all her cupids and bacantes. Missing from the picture is Tannhäuser himself, and of course, Tannhäuser was King Ludwig. Suddenly, the myths that had been simply on the dining room wall, as it were, suddenly they were on the stage. And with the magic of Wagner's music, Ludwig felt that they'd brought the myths right into his life. He therefore became, quite early on, a Wagnerian, if you like. And in the preface to the publication of the Ring Poem in 1863, this preface ends up with a great cri de coeur from Wagner. I've half composed this thing. I'm in terrible trouble. It needs somebody to rescue me, to come to my aid, so that I can complete the Ring, build the theater to perform it. Somewhere there must be a prince who could do that. Well, when Ludwig read this, he thought, well, that's me. Wagner was living a sort of bohemian life in a hotel, drinking champagne to forget his troubles. And when he got to Munich, uh, Ludwig uh, said, I'll give you enough money to give you even more champagne. I'll give you anything you want. And I'll offer you the kind of luxury. And Wagner saw this, of course, and he always wanted luxury. The sort of luxury you see behind me here in this uh, famous hall of mirrors in Heron Schloss Chiemsee. This is the kind of thing Wagner wanted. He saw himself as a prince of art um, on the one hand and a revolutionary of art on the other hand. So 
Ludwig made him live out this other part of his personality, and this is exactly what happened. Um, he built a house for him, and he had actually this house elaborately decorated with silks and satins and elaborate furniture. But the important thing is also that Ludwig gave him the opportunity to elaborate his life in the public sphere as well. Finally, at the age of 51, Wagner would enjoy premieres of Tristan and Isolde and the master singers of Nuremberg, his only comic opera, a nationalistic tribute to German art. He also began plans to build an opera house dedicated solely to the performance of his own music dramas. Behind us we have the Maximilianstrasse, the, one of the main streets in Munich, named after uh, Ludwig II's grandfather. The importance of the road is, though, it has this Versailles effect leading up to this huge building here, this Maximileum. And Wagner wanted a, the same kind of street, just a few yards long, leading up to his own opera house. It would have been then and now the biggest opera house ever built. Wagner wanted a big road from his house in the Briennenstrasse right across the middle of Munich. He wanted to flatten half the old town of Munich, leading right up to his new opera house, the biggest in Europe. Ludwig II said, I can imagine the crowd streaming into this road right up to your opera house, which is going to be next to the building my grandfather built, the Maximilianeum, and it's going to be art and politics architecturally side by side. Wagner's dream theatre was never built because of its exorbitant cost and its extremely unpopular reception with Munich's city authorities. But once again, Wagner's personal life took a new path. The conductor, very sympathetic to Wagner's music, uh, was this um, talented but rather stuffy and prosaic Prussian figure, Hans von Bülow, who was married to this beautiful daughter of Liszt. And Cosima was, I suppose, beautiful. I mean, if it, it's certainly Wagner thought so. <laughs> she looks a bit like a horse, but she uh, was beautiful enough to be going on with. And she provided what I think, to be fair to Wagner, he'd always wanted, which was somebody, A, serious-minded enough to talk or listen to him talking endlessly, and B, efficient and reliable. She was totally without a sense of humour, which was her great snag. <laughs> I think you rather minded that. She... Um worshipped him with an idolatry uh, bordering on hagiography. I mean, she kept his eyelashes and carried them around with her as if they were some holy relic. And I think Wagner rather warmed to this um, combination of servile uh, enthusiasm and um, intellectual stimulation. The relationship very soon produced an illegitimate daughter. The affair between Wagner and Cosima soon became the scandal of Bavaria, then Europe. But Wagner's relationship with Ludwig was also threatened because the king's family felt he was lavishing too much money on the composer. Wagner was exiled once again in Switzerland. Wagner came to Lucerne in 1866. He was traveling with his companion, as she then was, Cosima von Bülow, not yet his wife. On a boating trip one day, they discovered the villa at Triebschen and decided to acquire it. Here at Triebschen, Wagner worked on Siegfried, which he had taken up again after a long pause. Here also he wrote the Siegfried Idyll. Wagner, the idyll was a very special memento of his relationship with Cosima, celebrating the birth of their son Siegfried. The idyll was conceived as a birthday greeting for Cosima, and it was first performed early on the morning of her birthday in December 1870. Wagner had secretly gathered a group of musicians together, and they took up their places on the stairs here. Wagner himself stood at the head of the stairs conducting, with the children by his side. Luckily, Cosima 
who had been asleep in her bedroom, woke to hear the world premiere of her birthday greeting. Shortly before Wagner moved to Tribschen, Minna died, enabling him to marry Cosima. In the more settled atmosphere of his new home, Wagner was able to continue work on the ring after an astonishing 12-year gap, as well as finish the Master Singers of Nuremberg. It has been argued that during this period, Wagner began to integrate his racial theories into the characters of his music dramas. As a man of the theatre, it seems likely he could use such ideas to draw on the increasingly anti-Semitic responses in his audience. Beckmesser in Die Meistersinger von Nuremberg and Mima in Siegfried are the two that are usually discussed and what I'd like to draw attention to is the fact uh, that they have inferior bodies. A motif appears that Wagner associates explicitly with Beckmesser's poor perambulation and that motif is and that motif accompanies Beckmesser hobbling all over the place. There are uh, musical examples that pertain to the fact that the Jew was perceived to have a high nasal whining voice. Beckmesser is a bass, but he sings at times as high as a Helden tenor. I was kümmer doch Meister Sachsen, aber was mir Füßen ich geh, hieß doch noch nie mehr Sorge sich wachsen, dass mir nicht drüht die Zeh, doch seit mein Schuss ein großer Boe, da übel es um mein Schuh steht, das sieht wie schlappt und überall klappt, aus eine Fersen rein, ließ ich ihm gern daheim Historien spielen und schwenke dazu, brecht an die Morgen die Nacht. Most of all, you've got this incredible first act of Siegfried, which is the most violent anti-Semitic thing, amazing, uh, conceivable. If you listen to the Mima versus Siegfried, huge conclusion in the forging scene, you've got the heroic music and words of Siegfried forging the sword, combined with a wheedling, whinging, really disgusting, trivial music interjections by Mima. You know, he's cooking a broth made out of eggs with tin pots, and here is Siegfried forging the real steel. So it's the difference between real heroism and human degeneration personified as the Jew in Mima. Wagner's anti-Semitism, despicable, horrible, unacceptable, and yet, it was part of the zeitgeist at the time. I don't think you could be a German nationalist, which he was, at the end of the 19th century, without being an anti-Semite. In 1869, the already strained relationship between Ludwig and Wagner took a turn for the worse, when the king had the temerity to mount two parts of the ring in Munich without Wagner's consent. Nevertheless, Ludwig continued to idolize the composer. In 1869, five years after Ludwig met Wagner, he decided he wanted to build a new castle for himself, a castle of his very own. And it was standing up here on this very bridge that he decided that the right place was there. And it was quite deliberately modelled on sets from Wagner's operas, particularly from Lohengrin and from Tannhäuser. Wagner never saw this extraordinary tribute to his art. He had little interest in Ludwig's building projects since, at the age of 57, he'd failed to realize his own ambition to build a theater for his ring cycle. His first idea was to erect such a theater on the banks of the Rhine, and then perhaps in Zurich. And then he stumbled on a spot by the Lucerne called Brunnen. It was a curious idea. He was going to place the stage on the water and the audience on the shore, looking out beyond to a spectacular backdrop of the mountains. But he soon realized that due to the uh, rather changeable weather conditions there, that this simply wouldn't be practicable. Nevertheless, it's an intriguing thought that had things gone differently, the faithful would be making their annual pilgrimage to this beautiful spot in Switzerland, rather than to the unprepossessing German town of Bayreuth. This is the first 19th century opera house designed so that the audience should come not to look at each other, but so that they should look at the stage and only at the stage.
It is, of course, Wagner's Festspielhaus at Bayreuth on the hill overlooking the town. Finished in 1874, ready for the first performances of The Ring in 1876. It is an amphitheater, an amphitheater whose basic inspiration goes back to the Greeks. The orchestra and the conductor are hidden from the view of the audience. When the house lights went down, the auditorium was so dark that nobody knew when the music would begin. A darkened auditorium and a lightened stage forced Wagner's audience to concentrate on the images of his music dramas. The invisible orchestra provided a soundtrack for these images, and Wagner's concept of this total art form preempted the idea of cinema. Max Steiner, who wrote the score for King Kong, said that Wagner invented film music and he based his own style on Wagner. In fact, some people have said that Max Steiner's scores, particularly King Kong, is a, a, a concert with pictures. And that's one way of looking at Wagner. The important thing is the symphonic accompaniment and the big super spectacle. And in that way, I think Wagner really did anticipate the cinema. To enjoy the ring fully, you have to enjoy the special effects. It's part of it. It's part of what it's all about. We have the largest fire, I believe, ever seen on a stage anywhere. 230,000 units BTUs of uh, heat, of propane, that could come out for three or four minutes at a time. We always have firefighters on scene during all the special effects. Most of the time, they don't like the jobs I give them. This is one of the few jobs where they come back asking for more, and apparently they're all now Wagner fans. Having moved to Bayreuth to oversee the building of his opera house, Wagner worked on his last opera, Parsifal, whose scenes were partly inspired by a garden in Ravello in Italy, where he'd spent the summer months for health reasons. In Parsifal, Wagner returned once again to the Schopenhauerian themes of renunciation and redemption. The Christ-like Parsifal redeems the heretical Kundri by baptism and heals the eternal wound of the night Amfortas. In the prelude to Parsifal, he uses, instead of a, a lot of complex harmony, just one single line. But what he, what he does with that is, is, is extraordinary because he uses this amazing mixture of instruments, clarinet, bassoon, violin, some of the violin first, some of the second violin, some of the cellos, all playing the tune together. And the result is that, again, whereas in other works he deconstructs harmony, here he deconstructs the sound of the orchestra in a way. He's very, very skillful by now. He knows exactly what he's doing. It's very slow, but the momentum within that slowness is absolutely sure. There are no long errors at all. And I think that's the story that's the most sublime and has the greatest hidden depths in it, the more and more you know it. And the realization of it seems to me the most flawless. My first amt In the last year of Wagner's life, his racist views became more extreme. He was convinced that the only way to redeem the lower races, as he called them, was by an infusion of the pure, untainted blood of Christ, whom he believed was not Jewish, but Aryan. According to Cosima's diaries, Wagner's conversations became increasingly preoccupied by what he regarded as the Jewish problem. While he was composing Parsifal, he read that 400 Jews had died accidentally during a fire in a Viennese synagogue. Wagner made the drastic joke to Cosima that perhaps all Jews should be burned. Now, you can go at that in a number of ways. My own conviction is that people like ourselves 
perfectly ordinary people cannot grasp what is going on in the mind of a titanically complex creator who can create Parsifal and then say absolute barbaric inhumanities. So I prefer to say that the man who has given us what he has musically lies certainly outside my range of understanding. That doesn't mean it doesn't make me bitterly, bitterly disturbed, ill at ease, but that, to put it very vulgarly if I may, that's my problem and not his. Richard Wagner died in Venice on the 13th of February, 1883. He was nearly 70. Wagner's legacy has been immeasurable. His music stands at the threshold of modern Western classical music, and his influence on such composers as Mahler, Schoenberg, and Debussy was immense. Wagner's influenced virtually every composer who's lived after his time, with some exceptions, like most famously Stravinsky, who are very anti-Wagner. But the very violence of their hatred of Wagner is a form of tribute a form of being Wagnerian by default, by opposite. I find it very difficult to, to see this man sitting down and writing music. I can see him running a country or, or, or at least an airline and or probably owning a few. But, um, but I can't see him writing music. I just admire the daring. I just, I just admire the boldness of the whole, th the, the whole project, that he risked so much in his life and that he achieved so much. I mean, I, 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 it takes my breath away. How can you have among the highest achievements of beauty uh, or speculative elegance and audacity of the human mind and conscience and guts and viscera on the one hand and the awfulness on the other? Wagner's music is one of, as they say in a law court, it's exhibit A.